Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. In the winter of 1417, yes, I did say 1417, a young man named Poggio Braccolini was searching through a library when he found an odd manuscript sitting on a shelf. It was a thousand years old, the last surviving copy of a poem by a Roman philosopher named Lucretius. What Lucretius said in that poem was radical, heretical, in fact. What it contained was against all the teachings of God and men. It was called On the Nature of Things. First, he posited that the universe operated without gods and that matter was made of tiny, tiny particles that were in constant motion. Despite the danger, and this is explosive stuff in 1417, Bracciolini translated the poem and copies were carefully distributed over the next couple of hundred years. And the intellectual impact on Europe was incalculable. Lucretius' notions inspired new ways of thinking, leading to the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and all that followed. Bracciolini's translation of On the Nature of Things quite literally changed the course of humanity. Scholars have argued that because of him, the world became modern, that everything we take for granted today in terms of culture and thought happened because Bracciolini happened to find that one and only manuscript. But have you ever heard of Poggio Bracciolini? Probably not. I can't even pronounce his name properly. But he is one of the great unsung heroes of history. Now let's apply the same sort of thinking to the history of rock. Are there similar such people, people who did something that altered the course of music, yet we don't know about them? Absolutely. And it's time to give them credit. This is part two of Great Unsung Heroes of Rock. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. That's a band called Area 7 with Unsung Hero. A nice way to start the second half of this program on people who changed the world of rock for the better, but have never really received the appropriate amount of credit. We're trying to fix that. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and we're going to start with hair. When rock was born in the 1950s, it, like so many other musical styles, came with its own fashion sense. And a big part of the new rock and roll look was the way guys wore their hair. Originally, though, it wasn't all that crazy, and it wasn't all that different from what was being already sported by dudes everywhere. Neatly trimmed, greased back, maybe a ducktail, which was a precursor to the mullet, a bit of a pompadour, but that's about it. Now, it's not like there weren't guys with long hair, but they were weirdos and freaks and outliers. They were just off in the margins. But when the Beatles appeared, all that changed forever. The Beatles, at least in the modern era, were really the people who made it fashionable and cool for guys to have long hair. And it's virtually impossible to understate how much the Beatles' hair changed not just fashion, but society. Long hair became the way to show you were revolting against conformity and that you were a member of the counterculture of the 1960s. The status quo and the establishment saw long hair on men as an insult, something gross, something as proof that the world was going to hell. Entire governments were made very, very afraid of what was happening. In Indonesia, President Sukarno was so incensed that young men were imitating the Beatles' look that he declared this to be against the moral values of the country. He called their music Nyak Nyik Nyok, which means random noises, I guess. Not only did he make it illegal to have a Beatles haircut, he ordered barbershops not to give these haircuts, and he gave the police power to stop anyone with a Beatles haircut and forcibly give them a trim right then and there. Hold him, shave him completely bald, he declared. Cops were also equipped with a ketchup bottle. If they saw someone with tight pants, they could pull them aside and try to fit that bottle inside the pant leg. If the bottle didn't fit, the wearer was considered a rebel and their trousers were turned into shorts right there. But I digress. Eventually, though, long hair on dudes became a completely normal thing, of course, and a rock and roll look that continues today all over the world. Nobody gives it a second thought. And it all begins with the Beatles. They're the ones who made it okay. Fine. But who is responsible for the Beatles' haircuts? 
That's where we find our next unsung hero, or heroes, depending on the story. The first person we must credit is Jürgen Vollmer. In 1961, Paul McCartney and John Lennon decided to spend a little time in Paris. That's where they met up with Jürgen, who was a friend of Astrid Kircher, the girlfriend of Stu Sutcliffe, who was playing bass with that early version of the Beatles. There is some photographic evidence to suggest that Vollmer had been wearing his hair long and in a part, something that Paul described as a long-haired Hitler thing. John and Paul, who both still wore their hair back, as was standard for the time, were entranced by the way Jürgen wore his hair long and over his forehead. We want to look like you, they said. So he cut their hair, and so the Beatles' mop top was born, or at least the first version of it. About a year later, when the Beatles had their long residency in Hamburg, Astrid Kircher cut their hair regularly into this new look. She first gave the cut to Stu, and then George, and then finally John and Paul. And within two years, the Beatles were the biggest band on the planet, and their haircuts were almost as big as the music. Long hair on dudes was here to stay. And the unsung heroes in this case seem to be both Jürgen Vollmer and Astrid Kircher. Our next two unsung heroes are both drummers. Their work can be heard everywhere, and I mean everywhere. Yet they have not received the credit or the remuneration that they deserved. And both of their contributions can be traced to 1969. Let's start with Gregory Coleman. Yeah, never heard of him, right? He was the drummer for the Winstons, a multiracial, funky soul band out of Washington, D.C. In early 1969, the band went into the studio to record a single called Color Him Father. For the B-side, they ran through a track called Amen, Brother. One minute and 16 seconds into the song, the band drops out, and Coleman plays a four-bar syncopated drum break that lasts seven seconds. It goes like this. Let's hear that one more time. Okay, better do it again. That's part of an otherwise unremarkable B-side from 1969. Now, let's fast forward about a decade to when hip-hop was on the rise. DJs were looking for drum breaks that they could loop on their turntables. The funkier the break, the better. And someone, and we are not sure who, found Coleman's bit in Amen Brother and started to use it on the decks. When sampling technology came along using gear like the Akai S1000, one of the first affordable samplers, DJs and producers started messing with Coleman's drum break again and again and again. This became known as the Amen break. And here are just a few examples of what they did with it. According to the website Who Sampled, which tracks samples and songs, the Amen Break sample has been used no fewer than in 5,309 songs, more than any other sample in the history of music. 5,309 songs. It's all over hip-hop. It's all over electronic and EDM. And it's been employed by such artists as Slipknot, Primal Scream, Oasis, Nine Inch Nails, KMFDM, and literally thousands more. And once you know what to listen for, You'll hear the Amen break everywhere. Here's a sample. This is from Garbage, and they start using the Amen break in this song, starting at about 38 seconds in. That's Garbage and Push It, a song loaded with a variation of the Amen break, taken from Amen Brother by the Winstons, featuring drummer Gregory Coleman. But as the case with so many samples, neither Coleman nor the Winstons have seen any royalties from this, despite the fact that this piece of music has become part of so many other songs, some of which, many of which, have become major hits. Gregory Coleman actually died homeless and broke in 2006, not knowing about what he'd done for music. Richard Spencer, the leader of the Winstons, died in 2020. 
There's a similar story around Clyde Stubblefield, a drummer for James Brown's band. On November 20th, 1969, the band recorded a song called Funky Drummer. In it, the group stops playing, and at Brown's insistence, Stubblefield keeps his groove going. It's an eight-bar break that goes like this. This is looped several times over, so you can get a feel for it. That sound familiar? It should. That break has been sampled and looped in at least 1,700 different songs. Lots and lots of hip-hop, ranging from Public Enemy to N.W.A. to LL Cool J to Run DMC to the Beastie Boys. But also Ed Sheeran, Britney Spears, Nine Inch Nails, Kenny G, Stone Roses, Popolite itself, and Sinead O'Connor. In fact, it forms the rhythmic basis of this entire song from 1990 that won a Grammy Award. Sinead O'Connor with I Am Stretched on Your Grave, the lyrics of which are actually taken from an anonymous Irish poem written in the 17th century. And the entire drum part was adapted from Clyde Stubblefield's bit in the James Brown song Funky Drummer from 1969. Clyde fared a lot better than Gregory Coleman. He received no credits on the James Brown song, nor did he get any royalties from the hundreds of times his playing was sampled. But he did get recognition with various awards over the years. A set of autographed sticks is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Artists have come out in praise of his work. When he came down with cancer and kidney disease, Prince, who was a huge fan, paid for tens of thousands of dollars of Clyde's health care costs. And when he died in February 2017 at the age of 73, he was made an honorary doctor of fine arts. Yet, you gotta wonder how many people outside of the music community know of Clyde Stubblefield and the incredible effect he had on shaping music with that one drum break albeit unintentionally and very much uncompensated. More unsung heroes when we return, starting with a woman that some say is responsible for inventing punk rock. This is part two of an attempt to give credit where credit is due when it comes to people who made incredible contributions to music. Unfortunately, these contributions have been underestimated or overlooked entirely. Take the case of Jordan Mooney. Now, you would have to be a very serious student of British punk rock to know the name Jordan Mooney. She was born Pamela Rook in 1955 in a British town called Seaford. As she grew older, she realized that she didn't fit in in this small town, and part of it had to do with her fashion sense. When she was kicked out of school for her red and pink haircut, she was a big Bowie fan, she headed for London, where she got a job at Harrods. That was a bit stuffy, so she found a job at a place on the King's Road called Sex a weird boutique owned by Malcolm McLaren and his partner, Vivian Westwood. This is where the other kids who didn't fit in came to buy outlandish clothes. Pamela changed her name to Jordan after Jordan Baker in The Great Gatsby. She really got into the gig at the shop and was willing to wear anything and experiment with a variety of looks that were anything but conventional. Wild hair, daring makeup, see-through clothes, bondage gear. Whatever it was, she was game. She became something of a muse for McLaren and Westwood, who began tailoring clothes for Jordan, who would then wear them everywhere. She was basically a walking billboard for the shop, and because of her, business picked up, and a bunch of kids started hanging around the place. Four of those kids were corralled by McLaren, and he turned them into the Sex Pistols. And we know what they did for British punk rock, right? Jordan followed the Pistols everywhere as part of a pack of fans known as the Bromley Contingent, and wherever she went, she influenced the fashion sense of punk rock. Then she caught the eye of Andy Warhol. He took photos and even had her appear in one of his films. Jordan wasn't a singer. She didn't play any instruments. But she did act as a magnet and then as glue for an important portion of the original British punk rock scene. Did she invent punk rock? Maybe the look of it. But you also have to wonder if the Sex Pistols would have formed at all if she hadn't attracted those key customers to the store with what she was wearing out on the street.
The Sex Pistols, close friends of Jordan Mooney back in the day. Jordan eventually married Kevin Mooney of Adam and the Ants, another one of Malcolm McLaren's bands. And the job at sex ended. She fell into drugs and then moved back to the seaside. She raised Burmese cats, which led to a job as a veterinarian's assistant that lasted for three decades. Here's someone else who has been sadly overlooked. Her name is Tina Bell, and she might rightly be considered one of the inventors of grunge. Now, this is a sad example of important and influential people being left out of music history. Tina was a black woman who fronted a very groundbreaking band from Seattle called Bam Bam. And they were doing the grunge thing in 1983, a couple of years before that sound really began to catch on. The group featured her husband, Tommy Martin, a friend named Scott Lockwood, and a kid called Matt Cameron. The same Matt Cameron would later become part of both Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. Tina and Bam Bam were doing their thing before Nirvana, before Soundgarden, before Alice in Chains. But for reasons that are rather mysterious, Tina and the band were never given the credit they deserved. Now, before we go any further, let's have a listen to put this all into context. They recorded one album in 1983 called Free Fall from Space. It's an album that's long disappeared from shelves, but you can find pieces of it online. Here is a song from Bam Bam called Ground Zero. That's Seattle's Bam Bam, featuring singer Tina Bell, recorded in 1984, which, you know, sounds great, right? So why have so few people ever heard about them? It's very strange, considering that they played some very important gigs and festivals. They recorded at the same studio where Nirvana made their first records. They won some local music awards. They had the Melvins open for them. And get this, they once featured a roadie named Kurt Cobain. But they're almost completely expunged from the history of grunge. Even what exists about them online is often incorrect. Some mentions of the band leave Tina out entirely. There are several theories as to why this happened, race and gender being one. I mean, a black woman fronting this kind of punky rock band in a man's world? Were audiences and critics unable to grasp such a person doing such a thing? It's possibly. But then there are some writers who have compared Tina to Tina Turner. It could be that Bam Bam sound was a year or two early. Bad management might have been another reason. A record deal that went very wrong. Or maybe they stopped at the wrong time. Tina fronted Bam Bam until 1990, one year before grunge exploded. At the time of Tina's death in 2012, there was an effort to finally recognize her legacy with a documentary and memoir called Conversations with the Grunge Queen. Her son, TJ, is very on board. In fact, he won an Academy Award for co-producing a documentary in 2012, so this guy knows what he's doing. And if you've been paying attention to Pearl Jam, you might have heard Matt Cameron talk about Tina or even seen him wearing a Tina Bell t-shirt. Remember the name, Tina Bell and Bam Bam. We all should. A couple of more unsung heroes to go. Both these people changed the entire course of music and the music industry, but I wonder how many people know their names? I want to bring two, maybe three more unsung heroes to your attention before we wrap it up. It's impossible to understate just how much these people change things. The first guy is Karl Heinz Brandenburg. He is a German electrical engineer and mathematician who helped create a research lab called the Fraunhofer Institute for Digital Media Technology. While working towards his PhD in electrical engineering, Karl Heinz had an advisor named Professor Dieter Seltzer whose expertise was in the science of psychoacoustics. Seltzer had this dream of what he called a digital jukebox, a system whereby all the music in the world would be stored on a central server, which then could be accessed by anyone with a telephone line. Great idea. Seltzer applied for a patent, but it was rejected on the grounds that the examiner decided that what he proposed was impossible. It'll never work, he said. Denied! Brandenburg looked at the patent application and had a thought. What if there was a way to compress this music so it could be transmitted down old copper telephone wires? After much experimentation, he and his team figured it out. The algorithms used made a digital audio file 10 to 12 times smaller, which was enough for transmission down old-fashioned telephone lines. 
These files had the extension .bit. After more experimentation, plenty of demonstrations, and tests against competing technologies, MP3s were made the worldwide standard in 1993. The technique became known as Motion Pictures Expert Group 1 Layer 3, or MP3 for short. And in 1995, after more demonstrations and meetings, the file name extension was formally changed from .bit to .mp3. On July 4, 1994, Brandenburg and the Fraunhofer Society released the first MP3 encoder. The first MP3 player, that is, the first software program, was released on September 9, 1995. And from there, it was game on. Someone once asked Brandenburg if he realized what his team had created. He looked at them and said, no, what? And that person replied, you've just destroyed the music industry. Things got even worse when a hacker found the source code. He created an even better version, set it free on the internet, and, well, CD ripping went wild. This song for the Bare Naked Ladies kind of proves my point. You will see what I mean. Just wait for it. Wait. It's colder than it looks outside. It's like a dream you try to remember, but it's gotten in your... Hi, folks. This is Stephen Page. This is Tyler Stewart. We're two members of Bare Naked Ladies, and although you thought you were downloading our new single, what you're actually downloading is an advertisement for our new album, Maroon. It comes out uh, September 12th, and... Uh, after that point, I'm sure you can download lots of stuff from our record. But until then, you're just going to get lots of stuff with us bugging you. We fooled you, huh? We're sneaky like that. You can never trust a Canadian. Next thing you know, we'll be supplying your natural resources. Trying to scream, but it only comes out as young when you're trying to see the one beyond your front door. Bare Naked Ladies with what's become known as the spoof version of Pinch Me from the Maroon album. Once people got into the idea of exchanging songs over the internet, we really didn't have much further to go at least in a technical sense, before we went back to Professor Seltzer's idea of the digital jukebox. In other words, a streaming music service. First, we need to define what streaming is. This is the ability to listen to songs transmitted to your device over the internet on demand. Pure, full-featured streaming means you can access any song on any number of devices, anytime you want, wherever you happen to be. This is what we have with Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, and all the rest of today's platforms. We've seen that Professor Seltzer had the concept back in the 1980s. But who was first to put this into practice? Well, it might be Rob Glazer, an ex-Microsoft employee who created a company called Progressive Networks in 1994. He saw the internet as a new broadcasting system. He and his team created a proprietary system called Real Audio, which was designed to stream audio in both real time and from a dedicated server. Glazer was a huge Yankees fan, so one of the very first streams he set up was a game between them and Seattle on September the 5th, 1995. From there, experiments were done with all sorts of audio and video. I remember watching a real video broadcast of a Paul McCartney show from Liverpool in 1999. It was an image a little bigger than a postage stamp with glitchy video and terrible sound, but it worked. Okay, more or less. It was streaming audio and video but it wasn't modern streaming. In 1999, a team of six guys created a program that was used on a site called Tune2.com. This was a customizable internet radio station. They also came up with a prototype of Seltzer's celestial jukebox that they called Aladdin. In 2001, all that tech was purchased by a company called Listen.com. And from there, Aladdin was transformed into the first modern on-demand streaming service, which was called Rhapsody. It went live on December 31st, 2001. For a flat monthly fee, you got an all-you-can-eat buffet of music. They started with a bunch of indie labels, but by the middle of 2002, all the major labels were on board. And then it was bought by Real Networks, which was, of course, the new name for Rob Glazer's Progressive Networks. Rhapsody still exists, except that in November 2011, it bought what was left of Napster, all the intellectual property. And in 2016, Rhapsody completely rebranded itself as Napster, which is how it operates today. All right, so who invented streaming? Was it the guys behind Aladdin? Was it Rob Glazer's people at Progressive Networks? Was it Carl Heinz Brandenburg's mentor, Professor Dieter Seltzer? Actually, you know what? I'm going to say none of the above. The idea of streaming is a lot older than you might think. In 1881, 
a French engineer named Clement Adler demonstrated a system called the Théâtrophone at the International Exhibition of Electricity in Paris. Again, 1881. It worked by putting 80 telephone transmitters around the stages at various theaters around Paris. Telephone lines were then run from the theater to private homes. And for a subscription fee, you could listen to a live symphony or an opera performance from the comfort of your own home. And in stereo, too. This is like 70 years before stereo was invented because you had 40 transmitters put along the left side of the stage and another 40 along the right. Theatrophones were also installed in restaurants and lounges and private clubs where for 50 cent times, which was around 50 cents, you got five minutes of listening through a couple of tubes that you stuck in your ears. And you could listen to something like Verdi's Falstaff as it was being performed at the opera house without having to leave your house. Theatrophone services rolled out across Europe. It appeared in the UK under the name Electrophone, and the technology was even demonstrated in New York. This lasted a long time, too, all the way to 1931, in fact. And the thing that killed it? Radio, which required no wires running all over the place. Now you know why the British used to refer to radio as the wireless. The theatrophone, or the electrophone, take your pick, wasn't really on demand. And you obviously could not download anything. But it was streamed music, and it was a subscription service, and it was very personal. So, can we say that Clement Adler was the inventor of streaming music? Sure, why not? History is written by the victors. It's also written by critics. Both groups have their biases and prejudices, and therefore their reasons for highlighting and, in the case of this program, ignoring or underplaying the very important contributions of very important people. Hopefully these last two programs brought some new credit and appreciation to some people who made our music possible. More podcasts are available on your podcast platform of choice. There are hundreds of programs out there. Just download and go. Music news and information is available on a daily basis through my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. Get the daily newsletter too, because you know, it's free. We can meet up on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and all email can go to Alan at allencross.ca. Let's give credit to technical producer, Rob Johnston too. He's in the background. He's kind of, you know, unsung. So there. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.